in January 1725, there was a, a snow, as it was called, type of ship, a small sailing ship, came into the harbour here in Stromness. And it, I, it anchored in Kirsten Roads, which is at the back of the homes. There's two small islands in the, in the harbour here called the homes. And he anchored at the back of that. And uh, when he came ashore, people found to their surprise that the skipper of the ship, the, the captain, was John Gow. He was a local boy. Uh, his family originally came from Wake in Caithness. Uh, he was born in Wake, but he came to Orkney when he was about 18 months old or so. He was just a baby when he came here. So he was brought up here. And his father lived over at uh, uh, where Copeland's Dock is now, just where the new pier has been built in Stromness. That's where the house was. And uh, so he was kind of in his own turf. He was anchored near his own home. Um, now, people were really surprised because Gao was only a man in his mid-20s. Uh, but he was captain of a ship, you know, and that was a, a remarkably fast rise. Um, a, a, a rapid set of promotions for a young guy, you know. So they felt quite kind of justifiably proud of him. You know, local boy makes good. But... The crew was a different kettle of fish, you know. I mean, <clears throat> uh, Gal was swanking around the town, quite a thing, money to spend. Uh, but the crew were a really rum sort. They were, uh, they were not the, not the cream of society, shall we say? Local people kind of noticed this. There was a lot of, you know, um, a lot of drunkenness, which is not unusual. I mean, at one time. Stromness had about 40 different places selling alcohol, from pubs to old ladies that would brew uh, and sell it from the, the front rooms. Um, so there was always booze to be had. And uh, But then it was noticed that a lot of these guys, they would address them in the street as Jack, you know, how Jack. You never called your captain by his first name. On board the ship, that man was God. His word was law. You did what you were told. And you certainly did not be over-familiar with him by calling him Jack. People started to think this was a bit suspicious. But then there was a, a group of, uh, of sailors that came off the ship in the ship's longboat. And they raised the alarm that what John Gall was, was a pirate. This was a pirate ship. It was called the George when it came to Orney. Um, but originally it was called the Caroline. But Gall had signed on the Caroline as an officer and a navigator. And uh, he was said to be an intelligent young man. And uh, all went well, but he started to ferment mutiny on board the ship. He wanted to take over the ship and become a pilot. And he, apparently he tried that on his previous ship as well, but he couldn't find any support. So then he left. By the time that the captain was informed that Gal was trying to raise a mutiny, he'd already gone and he was on another ship. So... They're sailing off around the Bay of Biscay and across to the Azores, and uh, Gao <clears throat> manages to get a significant number of the crew to agree to seize the ship. And they rise up in rebellion, and the captain uh, and the surgeon are killed. They're shot and stabbed and thrown over the side of the ship. And then they have a vote because, of course, pirates are incredibly democratic about these things. They would vote for who their captain was going to be. They would follow him for as long as he was bringing in the goods, as long as he was getting ships and making the money, then they were, you know, they would follow him. 
But if he started to, you know, make bad decisions and, and look like he was an unlucky captain, they could vote him out as well and uh, appoint another captain. So <clears throat> they then go on a, a period of, uh, of raiding ships. But unfortunately for Gao, he was a very unlucky pirate. Most of the ships that they got were carrying stockfish, you know, dried fish coming from Scandinavia, um, going down to Spain, to Catholic countries for eating during Lent and on feast days. Uh, so they weren't making much money. They, they had uh, they had managed to, to pull off a, a bit of a stunt in one of the islands of capturing the governor there and, and getting a ransom for him before leaving again. Uh, but generally there was a lot of disharmony among the ships as well because there was a big ship that they said they should go after but go kind of wisely knew that it was way too overgunned for them it would blow them out of the sea so they uh, they decided to he decided to not pursue it but but that led to a mutiny and uh, which he managed to suppress but the guy that was leading the mutiny was a bit of a psychopath he was shot uh, in the the skirmish, shot and wounded, and put on a boat and set off, you know, cast adrift. Um, now, Gao thought I'll be the last we'll see of him, but unluckily for him, he was picked up and brought back to England and, and sang like a canary, told the authorities everything that was going on with Gao and the ship. Uh, putting his own neck in the noose as well, but he wanted to have his own back on, on Gao. Now, with limited um, sources, they, they did get lucky in catching, capturing one ship that had a quantity of brandy on board, so at least they had something to drink. But Gao then came up with this kind of genius idea. He knew that all the lairds in Orkney, all the big landowners, Generally, their houses were doomed by the shore because they were traders. Um, their rent was paid in kind, and then they would take that to Dune to the Western Isles or across to Norway or down to Holland. Uh, they would sell the goods there and then they would buy more goods, which they would take back to Orkney, and they would trade here. So, in order to have that, that sea going trade then you needed a hoose by the shore. And uh, so a lot of the lads' hooses were right by the shore. So he thought we could raid these hooses. We'll put into a strongness. We'll get the ship sorted out because it, it needs it needs a bit of attention, you know. Um, so we'll carry it repairs and then we'll raid the laird's hooses. We'll go around the islands, raiding them and then carrying off whatever valuables they could get their hands on. Now, uh, word of this was then, once the, these guys had taken the longboat uh, and came ashore, they, the news was out that, you know, these guys were pirates. <clears throat> and uh, the militia was raised in Kirkwall. Now, one of the guys that raised the, the militia was William Honeyman, who lived at Clestron in Orford. And it was his house that was raided uh, by Gao, the, the first one. They, they went to the, raid the house. There are various stories about the, uh, um, about the raid. I mean, they, they came about 11 men uh, came, knocked on the door at night, they opened the door, they rushed in. Now, various versions of events. The one is that Mrs. Honeyman um, feigned <coughs> uh, hysteria, ran around screaming, but she had gone and taken all the, the gold that they had in the house and hidden it under her clothing and then ran around screaming, ran off into the night, kind of wailing. And uh, they just let her go, you know, hysterical woman. No, very 
crafty woman, very clever woman, outsmarted them. She got the valuables in those. Her daughter, meanwhile, threw all the uh, the deeds out of the deed chest, out a window, uh, our upstairs window, and then jumped down and gathered them up and ran off with them because they were going to burn them. So this is all the titles to the land of the old. Um, so they're left with very little. Another version has it that the uh, the honeymoon women just sat quietly embroidering, uh, quiet, but having hidden all the valuables under their skirts. And, uh, you know, these pirates were cutthroats, but they, there was a certain gentlemanly kind of quality as well. They, they didn't have, they didn't have just, uh, you know, they wouldn't be looking under the, the, the women's skirts. Another story is that they hid all the valuables under a pile of uh, feathers that had been lying out for stripping, for putting into cushions, pillowcases, you know, beds, uh, mattresses. Uh, they hid the valuables under that, and the pirates, being bits of dandies, didn't want to ruin their new clothes by pulling in among a lot of pile of feathers, so they just left them. But anyway, they, they didn't get much. They got some silver cutlery and they got, uh, they, they took a, a captive, uh, um, a man uh, from the island of Gramsie who was a servant there who would play the bagpipes. And they had them, they had him play his pipes and pipe them back to the ship. But then they kept him on board. It's kind of like human jukebox. He would play tunes for them. Uh, he didn't want to be there. Now, they had recruited a couple of people in Orkney who didn't know that they were pirates. They just signed on to a ship. One of them was a potinger fellow for Westry. And the next port of call was going to be Karakhus in the island of Eddie, in the North Isles, because he'd been at school with Gao. Uh, Gao knew where he lived. He also knew that he was loaded. You know, he had lots of money. Um, so they went up... <clears throat> Hidden through a calf soon between the calf of Eddie and Eddie. Uh, the Pottinger fellow was the pilot, the Westry man. But he deliberately put her into a tide stream that caused the ship to go on the rocks on the uh, calf soon, on the calf of Eddie. Now, what you would do in that circumstance is when you would take the long boat out with a cage anchor in it. You would row out a distance, you'd throw the anchor over the side, and then you get the men on the on the capstan on the winches would would pull the anchor cable, which would drag the ship off the shore. But they didn't have a long boat because those guys that had fled from the ship took the boat with them. So they didn't have a ship's boat. So they couldn't take the anchor out. And uh, relying on trying to float it at high tide, the only achi the achievement they got there was that they put higher up on the rocks. And then there was a bizarre set of, uh, of communications going back and forth between Gao and James Fay, who was the, the owner of Karakus. Appealing to their old friendship from school days, you know. Oh, I'm, I, there's been lots of rumours going around about me. I'm not as bad as they're making out, you know. And he tries to, when he's getting nowhere with that, he tries to um, to go for Faye's wife, thinking that he might be able to make a friend with her and she might influence her husband. So he, uh, he sent a dress ashore uh, for her where he'd stolen that from, I don't know, but I don't suppose it would be from his own wardrobe. But um, the the dress was given as a gift to her anyway. Also appealing to her to use her influence with her husband to, you know, uh, patch things up between them. But uh, it was to no avail. And some of the pirates went across to try to seize her boat. Um, they were invited to uh, an outbuilding where there was booze. And they and the islanders were all drinking together, but the islanders weren't drinking. They were pretending to drink, but they weren't really knocking it back. The pirates were. And when they were drunk, the men were able to overpower them and tie them up, and they were locked in a shed. And then more came across, and they were able to overpower them as well and tie them up. And 
uh, till in the end, uh, Gal was eventually, um, he wasn't persuaded to come across, but they were able to, to capture him and, and bring him across as a prisoner. There was a legend that he tried to escape from Karakus from an upstairs room and was shot. And uh, there is a, a blood stain on the floor that is supposed to be his blood. And the, the owner of the house, um, who uh, in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, said that they, they had lifted some floorboards there and they'd found this black material under it that was in the you know, heather, they were using heather for insulation. It was this black kind of tarry sort of substance and it had been sent off for analysis and it was supposed to be human blood. But again, that's hearsay. I mean, that's what she told me and I'm not saying that she's not telling the truth, but I've never seen anything uh, documentary to, to back that up. But anyway, Gao and his men were sent to London. There was a frigate called the Greyhound that came up and uh, managed to get the ship refloated. <clears throat> and uh, he was taken to London when he was tried for piracy. The guy that he put off what he thought was fatally wounded in the boat, he was there giving evidence, singing like a canary. And uh, so they selected the ringleaders and they were tried. Uh, poor guys like the Piper and the Pottinger guy that had you know, put the ship on the rocks. They were also kind of arrested, but were released without charge because they hadn't done anything. And um, so <clears throat> the thing is that they couldn't hold the trial until the accused entered a plea of guilty or not guilty. Gow refused to plead. Refused to plead. So. He was, uh, he was pressed. So they put him in a cell and they put weights on his chest. And uh, the only drink he was allowed was from uh, basically an open sewer that ran outside his cell. Uh, and his thumbs were to be bent back with a whip cord and broken. And weights put on him until he either came gave a, a plea or died and uh, so kind of seeing that the game was up he he pleaded not guilty so the trial went ahead and uh, there was plenty of evidence I mean they would capture a ship take what was on board but then they would put, they would take the crew on board, but then they would put the crew from the previous ship that they'd raided on the ship that they'd just captured and, and set them off with it. In some cases with presents as well, they were cutting a quantity of beeswax as part of the channel cargo on the ship. So they would give them this wax and, and send them off where we press <laughs> It's kind of bizarre behavior. Um, but they were there saying, yes, that was the man that stole our ship and, you know, and took our cargo. Uh, so he was found guilty and sentenced to be hanged. And once his body, he was hanged at Wapping Stairs by the River Thames. Once his body had been washed twice by the tide, he was the body was to be tarred and hung in chains as a warning to any other would-be pirates sailing up the Thames to go into London. And uh, so he was taken up the ladder, noose was put around the neck, the ladder was pulled away, down he came. But in those days, there was no scaffold with a trap door that, you know, you fall down, you break your neck, you're instantly, you're dead they would pull away the ladder and then you would fall and you would swing literally you'd swing and uh, <clears throat> you would depending on how heavy you are depending on how quick you'd die uh, a big geezer like me you, you'd be beaten you know short time because your body weight's pulling you down 
But if you're a thin guy or a wee guy, you hang up there slowly being strangled to death over a long period of time, you know, I mean, 10 minutes has been mentioned. Uh, so uh, not a quick death. So, and this was happening with Gao. He was just hanging there, you know, struggling away, um, but still alive. So the hangman, and kind of out of pity, to put him out of his misery, went and grabbed him by the ankles and pulled him down to break his neck. But the rope broke, and so Duny came. And uh, so once they got him up, he was still able to walk. They got a new a new rope, and he was taken back up the ladder again and uh, and rehanged. Uh, this time it was it was successful. And uh, he had his two washes of the tide, and then he was body was tied and hung in chains. And that was the end of Gal the pirate. But there was a little folk tale attached to this, which may have some truth in it, may not. Um, but it was said that there was a, a neighbour, there was neighbours called Gordon, was the surname, and their daughter of Harch was called Helen. Now again, I can't find the documentary evidence. I read this somewhere, but anyway. Um, they would have known each other when they were kids, because they were neighbours. And uh, when he came back in his mid twenties, and she was a you know attractive young woman, and uh, and John Gow fell for her, and one night they slipped away to the Stones of Stennis, a Neolithic stone circle, and there was an outlier to the stone circle called the Stone of Odin. And it was a standing stone on its own that had a hole through the middle. And if you held hands through that and plighted your troth, you swore the Odin oath. It was regarded as binding as a legal marriage. And the only way to break it would be to go into the old Kirk at Stennis, which is no longer there, the old 12th century church, stand back to back in front of the pulpit and walk through doors on opposite sides of the building uh, without looking back. And then that was it. The oath was broken. You could hold, if the person died, you could hold the dead hand that he'd held in life and renounce the oath. If the person was lost at sea, say, and there was no body, that was it. You were stuck. You couldn't marry anybody else. You were, that oath was so binding that you could never contemplate marrying anybody else and breaking the Lord oath. No good would come of it if you ever tried to do that. So they swore that plighted the troth, they swore on the old north at the Odin stone and uh, and then came back. And then, of course, he was arrested and he was executed. And the young woman is in Orkney and, of course, she's, you know, desperate with grief, but she's got a problem. Now she can't marry anybody else because she's made the old north. She's got to go to London and, and see him and uh, and hold his hand and, and renounce the oath. But by the time that she gets there, she's too late. He's he's already dead. Now this is a time when people that had to go on sea voyages were advised to make their will and have all their legal affairs put in order because the chances of surviving a sea voyage was not good. Well, the chances of being lost at sea was quite high. But. She made that trip all the way to young London, young woman, you know, early to mid-twenties. And um, she went, found the body of her late lover, hanging in chains, tar, and she held the tarred hand that she'd held in life and renounced the oath. And she was free to come back and to marry again and to live her life. Now that's the story as we tell it in Orkney. But we are we are known to be very romantic, Arcadians. We were voted the most romantic place in Britain by readers of Milton Boone. Romantic novelettes about three years ago. So who am I to argue with the with the readers of Milton Boone? But um, in Caithness, they've got a different version of the story. And the story goes that they did indeed go and plight their troth at the Odin Stone. 
but that when he was executed in London, what she did was she just hired somebody to go and cut off his the dead hand that she'd held in life and post it to her. And then she could hold the hand, renounce the oath, and then toss the hand to the dog or something like that, you know. Not a problem anymore. So uh, that's that's the story. Now, Daniel Defoe, the writer, covered the story uh, for the newspapers at the time. He was the equivalent of a tabloid journalist of his day. And uh, he wrote that he'd been reporting the story of, you know, pirate stories were always really popular. So there was a, a little pamphlet, a wee booklet was published. And it's thought to be Defoe that wrote it. And uh, they're very rare, but there are a few copies around. Um, there are two in Orkney. There's one at the library in Kirkwall, the Orkney Library. And there's one at Strum's Museum. So uh, it's a wonderful source of information for the, the story. But, um, but then the story reappears because in 1814, um, the Northern Lighthouse board, uh, the, the yacht, the Pharos, was doing a tour of the Northern Lights, when the commissioners of Northern Lights were touring. And they invited a young writer called Walter Scott with them. This was before he was Sir Walter Scott. He was just plain Watty Scott in those days. And uh, <clears throat> he came to Stromness, uh, a place that he didn't like very much, to say the least. Uh, he said he had to go to Stromness to see that there was a worse place in the world than Kirkwall. And uh, they went up the Bray, at Brinkies Bray, to meet me, Bessie Millie. Now, Bessie was a weather witch, and she sold fair winds to sailors for sixpence. And she claimed that she didn't use any evil powers, but it was her prayers. And she boiled the kettle and she muttered prayers over it, and that was supposed to give you your, your fair wind. Although she did say that you might not get your fair wind immediately, but if you waited, you know, you would get it eventually. And she claimed to be uh, about 100 years old. It's a wonderful description by Scott saying that she had a... Um, her skin was brown like a mummy, uh, but her eyes were uh, glinted with a, with a gleam of insanity, a piercing light blue eyes, and a nose and a chin that were hooked and almost met in the middle, which gave her the appearance of a real Hecate, he said. Uh, <clears throat> so... They go up and they visit Bessie, and she tells him the story of Gow the Pirate, who she claims she remembers as a young woman, as, as a child. She remembered him in, in Stromness. Um, whether she did or not, no idea. But she passed on the story to Scott. And in 1822, he published a novel called The Pirate, which was based on the story of Gow. Uh, and also a tradition in Orkney where you wouldn't rescue people who were drowning uh, if there was a shipwreck or whatever. You would leave people to you know, struggle ashore or whatever, but you wouldn't help anyone. Because if you saved somebody from the sea, the sea needed to have a certain number of victims every year. They needed It needed its prey. And if you cheated it of somebody's life uh, by saving them, then it would come back on you, a member of your family would drown to make amends for stealing the life from the sea. Um, so no luck, they thought, would come from anybody that you rescued from the sea. And in the story, the, the, the hero of the piece saves this guy, Captain Cleveland from Shipwright, who then goes on to steal his girl and blacken his reputation, spread stories about him, and then become really popular at the expense of the guy that saved his life.
Of course, there's a big romantic ending. There's a witch, Norn of the Fitful Head, who was based on Bessie Millie. It takes in the swearing, the oath on the Odin stone, so he must have had that story as well. They also, the dwarfy stain and hoy is brought into him. He visited there. So he's using all these places that he's seen uh, as a part of the story. So it's, it's based predominantly in Shetland. He's saved in Shetland. Um, but then they have this sort of progression of coming to Orkney and such like that. Um, and then they discover that the guy that saved them, of course, is actually his brother. Which they don't know this. And their mother is the witch. And uh, they all have a happy ending of Cleveland goes away, leaves them to it. He admits to being a pirate and he, he clears off. Uh, the guy gets his girlfriend back and his uh, girlfriend's beautiful sister, who is rather enamoured with Cleveland as well, um, just spends the rest of her life as an old maid, which was considered at the time to be, that's the just thing to do. She didn't marry, serves her right, that was her punishment. So, you know, it's kind of a, it's a highly romanticised version, but it, it's the story of Gal the Pirate.